the drama surrounding Abramson's firing overshadowed another big New York Times story last week, the leak of an internal report on the newspaper's decade-long push into digital. Some media analysts are calling the Times Innovation Report one of the seminal documents of our media age. Simply titled Innovation, the internal report takes a frank look at how well the New York Times is transitioning to digital. The stark conclusion, not well enough. While the Times homepage still gets 80 million monthly visitors, that's just 60 percent of what it got two years ago and trails digital upstarts Huffington Post and BuzzFeed. A case in point, the report says, I want to live. When the movie 12 Years a Slave recently swept the Oscars, the Times tweeted out its own original 1851 article detailing Solomon Northup's story, then watched as Gawker repackaged their article and got tremendous traffic. Yeah, that's his people. One bright spot was the Times' groundbreaking feature, Snowfall, both an innovation in digital storytelling and a popular success. But the rub? The Times is not devoting enough resources to replicating that success day in and day out. So one of the big ideas in this uh, innovation report, which we should mention, is uh, authored, among others, by Arthur Salzberger's son, who is also named Arthur. That's how they do things over there. <laughs> uh, suggests that the Times should be able to generate uh, web traffic similar to, say, BuzzFeed or the Huffington Post. I don't know if I buy that idea, because BuzzFeed, while they do some really good, serious news reporting, they are predicated on, on churning out content like, you know, which international city you should live in, or embarrassingly, I think last week, uh, which Supreme Court justice should you fantasize about, you know, stuff that's supposed to be sh uh, clickable and shareable. And I just don't know if the Times' serious journalism uh, is, is fated to get the same kind of traffic, however you present it, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, you know, that isn't, I, I think that's a little bit of an unfair characterization of the report, because what the report is saying is that there are certain things that the Times could learn from BuzzFeed and from the Huffington Post to promote their own journalism. And one of the points that the, re the, the report makes is that people at the Huffington Post are saying, you know, we're getting more traffic essentially aggregating New York Times journalism than the Times is getting. Right. Like and, that and, Gawker uh, repackaging. Right, uh, exactly. The, and they Solomon really need to learn story. from this. On the other hand, I do want to point out that David Warsh, a smart guy, former Boston Globe economics columnist, wrote a very interesting critique of the Times report this week in which he made some of the, he, he expressed some of the uneasiness that you feel, Adam, in that he said, you know, fundamentally, the Times is not in the same business as BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. and the Huffington Post, and it has to be thought of in a different way. So I think it's a good, big, important report, but I also think that maybe people are making a little bit too much of it. But a lot of their comparisons were not with BuzzFeed and Huffington Post, but with the Washington Post yes. Yes. and with The Guardian USA and today. with Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. that have taken... Uh, early steps and ma more major steps to do this. Washington Post, as we know, just having hired 50 more digital people. Wall Street Journal is, has been way ahead with their paywall and, and, uh, and the things they've been doing. To me, that was the most important part of this report, is that th when they talked about their competitors and how they've fallen behind. Also, in setting it up, a couple of the errors that they discussed were very telling to me. Uh, the mention of the invisible child mm -hmm. story, for example, and how the reporter didn't tweet about it. For two and days. For two days. This yeah. young girl named Dasani, yeah. right? Dasani, yeah. right. That and story marketing which, didn't know about it ahead of time. Yeah. Amazing, because I after it ran, crazy. it became a huge, I won't mm -hmm. say quite viral, well, I guess it was sort of viral okay. for them, but it could have been handled so much better. Mm -hmm. And it, that's a sign of the kinds of things that they were not doing well. And I was really glad to read that, that they noted it. Well, I thought it was interesting that it's digital first, because they're clearly not accepting digital as first. That's the issue. They've got very strong readership. I'm one of them. Uh, you know, lawmakers and newsmakers and power brokers are the other group that read the print version. And I'm sorry, they're skewing to the print version. They do not get that digital has to have their, their intense attention so that these right. kinds of errors do not happen. So you can get serious stories out there among people who are trying to find them, but you have got to put it out 
out there in a consistent way that makes it interesting. And you can't look down your nose at people who do it well. All that being you know? said, print is where the Times gets most of its revenue, and the report acknowledges that. At this that, moment. But, at this moment, at this moment. But how do you deal with that? If you are Arthur, uh, Arthur Salzberger uh, Jr., how quickly can you move away from your main money? Well, maker? the fact is well, the Times, more than anybody, has been phenomenally successful in getting digital-only subscribers, paying customers. So they actually have less of this problem than, than most other newspapers do. One of the other things that really struck me about the report was that they are still putting hours and hours a day yes. into tinkering with page one. And they're saying, you know, the energy would be better put elsewhere at this point. And that, of course, is one other conclusion, that the home page is dead, right? That people don't go to a home page as a, well, a primary do. Now, again, using myself. I don't go to the homepage that often. Hmm. I come various other ways. Why? Because I know they're not tweeting about the stuff that I'm interested in. I have to go find it someplace else or somebody sends it to me. And then when I look at the front page, it's just to see, well, did, where did they put something versus maybe Washington Post? But that's an inside baseball game, I think, for those of us in the business. Right. That doesn't interest people who are just trying to get interesting stories. Let's move on to one more hmm. local story for this week. When John Henry announced his intention last November to sell the Worcester Telegram and Gazette, he personally assured Telegram staff that he wanted to sell to a local owner and was quoted as saying, if we don't find the right owner, you're stuck with me. Apparently no longer, as Henry reached an agreement this week to sell the Telegram to Halifax Media Group, a newspaper chain based in Florida. Former Telegram editor Harry Witten called it a tough day for my former colleagues. Dan, you've been following the situation pretty closely. What's your take on this outcome? Well, you know, I mean, it's if you look at what John Henry said last fall to the staff, it's certainly a surprise because he seemed to be saying, I'll either sell the local owners or I'll keep the paper myself. And I, I don't know whether that would, whether you would call that an ironclad promise or not, but it's something that he seemed to walk away from fairly quickly. Uh, now, we don't know that much about this Halifax newspaper group. Uh, they're fairly new. This is their first paper in the Northeast, they, they mostly own papers in the southern part of the country, and uh, it's already been announced that there's going to be cutbacks. Some yeah. people are going to lose their jobs. Uh, I guess what we can hope is that they'll make their cuts, and then they'll get serious about trying to put out the best paper they can. I think what would be deadly if it's a situation where there's one round of cuts, then another, then another, then another, and, yeah. and hopefully that's not what they're going to do. Yeah, it concerns me because this is an investor group, and I always get nervous thinking an investor group is not necessarily that interested in, in what's happening on the ground. I hope I'm wrong. But they, they are an investor group that has a couple of really good papers, and I think they also have a plan that is a national plan, and I think it's too early to judge that they're not going to do the right thing. I have a, some disclosure here in that I'm friends with uh, Jim Hobson, who was the, uh, the the publisher who who managed this? We we're actually old high school classmates, mm -hmm. but um, and I did uh, communicate with him about this, and he was very firm that the local owners that they wanted to find did not materialize, and that they did look for them, and um, and then I looked a little bit more into this Halifax operation. They have a couple of really terrific papers. The Sarasota paper in Florida is very good. Uh, part of the group also owns the Las Vegas paper, the Review Journal. There's a possibility that they will go national with this. And my sense, and again from talking to my friend Jim, is that they're very serious about the quality of the journalism there, but it's going to be done with fewer people, and that is quite sad. Yeah, yeah I hope that's true. I mean, I do think there were probably some chains we could think of that it would have been in a worse choice. Uh, I think that Halifax deserves a chance to uh, prove that they are going to be good stewards of the Telegram and Gazette. I hope they are. I also wouldn't be surprised if they start scooping up some other papers uh, in the Northeast. Mm. The Digital First chain uh, seems likely to be broken up, according to newspaper analysts like Ken Doctor, and that would put papers like the Berkshire Eagle, the Lowell Sun, and the New Haven Register in play, potentially. Wow. It wouldn't make sense for them to have just one paper here, I think. Hmm. If there are any TNG staffers who feel a sense of betrayal uh, in the wake of the sale, should they? I mean, was John Henry really under any kind of obligation, whatever promise he made or whatever strong suggestion he made, he really wasn't obligated to keep this paper at all, right? He wasn't obligated well, to, yeah. but he did make a pretty strong suggestion that if I can't find a local buyer, I'm going to keep it, and right. he didn't do it. Could he have found a way, if he had kept it, to make it work well with the Globe? 
you know, already their business operations were heavily intertwined mm -hmm. because the New York Times company uh, managed them as one unit. So I do think he could have found a way to do it. On the other hand, he could have folded the T&G and made it kind of a western outpost of the globe. So that would oh, have been con that idea. would have been considerably worse for people who work at the T&G than than the than the outcome that ultimately happened.